Hey, everyone. This is uh, Dwayne Monroe. And um, what you're about to hear, or see, as the case may be, if you're listening to the audio version, of course, you'll only hear it, is the first episode of, uh, of a new uh, internet program about film called Film Conversations. And the, the idea behind Film Conversations is that a few friends get together and talk about a movie, talk about film, from uh, several different perspectives. Uh, of course, conversation about the film itself, um, and not merely whether or not we like it or not, but um, the, the movie's place within, say, broader cultural history. Um, and also about what I would call the material aspects of a film production and the money and uh, that went into it and um, various other uh, aspects of a film that are often neglected, I think, in some of the YouTube-based um, film criticisms, which seem to fixate on whether or not you actually like a film or not. So, today's film under consideration is Inherit the Win, which is a, an American film from 1960. And what I'm going to do right now is read the Wikipedia synopsis of the film, because I think it's actually quite good. Here goes. Inherit the Wind is a 1960 American film based on the 1955 play of the same name written by Jerome Lawrence and Robert Edwin Lee. The film was directed by Stanley Kramer. It stars Spencer Tracy as lawyer Henry Drummond and Frederick March as his friend and rival Matthew Harrison Brady. It also features Gene Kelly, Dick York, Harry Morgan, Donna Anderson, Claude Aikens, Noah Beery Jr., Florence Eldridge, and Jimmy Boyd. Now let's get to the plot. In the small southern town of Hillsborough, in the 1920s, a school teacher, Bertram Cates, is about to stand trial for teaching Darwinism, which is a violation of state law. Cates is denounced by town leaders, including Reverend Jeremiah Brown. The town is excited because Matthew Brady, a noted statesman and three-time presidential candidate, will be assisting in the prosecution of Cates, a staunch foe of evolution and a biblical scholar. Brady will sit beside prosecuting attorney Tom Davenport in the courtroom of Judge Coffey. So that's the plot of the movie. In this conversation, you'll be hearing from myself, but also from Dennis Claxton, who is a trial attorney based out of California, and R.C. Charles Roberts, who is a writer, internet polemicist, um, who approaches film from a literary perspective. Both Dennis and Charles, I think, bring a pretty unique uh, point of view to this uh, particular film, and I think it's a fantastic conversation, and which I hope you enjoy. So, hey everyone, this is Dwayne Monroe with the uh, inaugural, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, edition of um, Film Conversations, a, I suppose you could say a podcast, uh, a video um, thing uh, the point of which is to talk about film um, from well, what I'm calling a more chill and mature <clears throat> perspective. Now, chill and mature does not mean dour. It doesn't mean we're going to be uh, being depressed. It just means that we actually will talk about the movie um, um, under review and some of the implications of it, the production and so forth. Um, rather than whether we simply liked it or not. And a lot of film criticism or in the, the internet age has come down to uh, the people who made the movie are idiots and I'm a genius for yelling, yelling about the movie, which I, I, I think the three of us um, agree is a subpar approach to talking about film. Uh, I don't think either, any of us are actually professional film critics, but we are people who've spent a lot of time um, marinating with film of various decades 
um, primarily probably American film, but, but world, so-called world cinema as well. Uh, I, for example, um, am a rather large fan of the work of Akira Kurosawa. Uh, with me today is uh, Dennis Claxton and R.C. Charles Roberts. Um, Dennis, let's start with you. How would you like to describe yourself to our, to our audience, which hopefully eventually will grow to multitudes? Well, first, I want to explain the hat. The hat has to do yes. with today's movie. Yes. I believe this is the exact same Stetson that uh, Spencer Tracy wore in the movie we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm absolutely... Uh, now, for those who will listen to the audio version of this and not see the video, it is a very, very handsome hat indeed. Um, uh, I, I, bought I, this, I, uh, I bought this in San Juan Capistrano. Mm-hmm about two weeks before the original uh, COVID lockdown. Mm -hmm. So I can, I, can, I can place this in time and space very specifically. That is, uh, it's, it's a fantastic purchase, actually. I used to have a fedora uh, in the 1990s when there was a craze of people trying to look like they were from the 1940s. And it was quite, it was a Stetson, as a matter of fact. It was really handsome. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, uh, I mean, Stetson, it's like Cadillac. Yeah, that's no. precisely right. Well, so uh, uh, the, the hat aside, <laughs> as, <laughs> as lovely as it is, how, how would you describe your, how would you say your, your approach to film, your thought about film, and, and perhaps this film in particular, but just film in general, actually? Um, I think I could break it down into two or three kind of uh, phases. Uh, and probably the most important is childhood. Uh, watching movies on television a lot. But also, I come from a small town in Oklahoma. And I worked at, uh, there were two movie theaters in town. I worked at both of them. One was a theater in town, inside theater. And one was a drive-in. I worked at both. I I'm very familiar with the projection booth, with the concession stand. In fact, I lived at one of those theaters for a while. I was, oh the, I was the Phantom of the Royal Theater because oh it was, uh, uh, there was an office space that it was a, an apartment that was converted. And uh, my employer let me live there. So I lived, in the, I lived in that theater for a while. Oh, wow. It was, uh, yeah. Uh, so I have experience from those days um, of watching movies a piece at a time, mm -hmm. you know? I remember watching Chinatown, uh, not from beginning to end, mm -hmm. but, you know, a scene at a time. And um, so then uh, the second phase would probably be going to school, you know, film classes, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And the third phase would be, I have a 24 year old daughter. And so it would be watching stuff when I could, basically. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And now it's uh, mostly streaming, of course. Yeah. I, I don't know about you guys, but I have only seen a movie inside a theater about five times in the last 10 years. Yeah, streaming has definitely taken over uh, the industry to a large extent. And uh, I think the expectation is that if you're going to go to a theater or to a cinema, you're going to see something that is a CGI spectacular rather than like a drama. Uh, uh, my, my wife and I, before we left the United States, we went to see the film uh, Phantom, uh, Phantom Thread with Daniel Day Lewis um, in a restored theater in uh, a town, um, uh, an old town uh, to the north of Philadelphia. Um, and that was quite an experience because uh, we hadn't been to a theater in some time to see a film, like an actual proper film about people as opposed to you know being about guys with uh you know machined combat suits or or gods or something um and it was actually quite lovely to see like a a film 
a, a proper film on on the large screen. But yeah, streaming has definitely taken over uh, the industry. Um, it's lucrative. There's material reasons for that. They can certainly guarantee a return on investment. Um, and also, you know, for many people, certainly in the states, it's uh, it's difficult to actually find the time, you know, to go to a, to go to a movie theater. So, uh, should we turn? Um, should we uh, move on to Charles to get? Uh, um, you know, can I can I interrupt just a moment? I've lost you guys. I, I can only see myself. Well, that's because I actually. Um, oh, here we are. Was was giving you the focus? Oh, at, okay. As you spoke, <laughs> like a proper like a proper show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, our the other uh, member of our group here is uh, R.C. Roberts, um, who is a writer and uh, internet. Um, um and also a person who I, I think uh, approaches film from a literary perspective. Uh, Inherit the Wind, I think, is an important film uh, for you. And by the way, for those who aren't familiar with the film, I will be reading um, a synopsis of it to give you um, an overview, um, an introduction to what the film is and what we're talking about in just a moment. But um, before I get to that, Charles, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and and um, about your relationship, perhaps, to this film as well. <clears throat> well, um, I was going to say, uh, when you noted earlier that uh, none of us are film critics, I am a, I am, I'm a nat I'm naturally a critic, so I don't mm -hmm. know. We're talking about film, and I'm a mm -hmm. critic. And so, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, so... Uh, yes, I'm a I'm a writer. I'm a lowly internet polemicist and uh, literary. Um, I, I do literary mm -hmm. reviews, um, often to detrimental effect. And um, my relationship to film, unfortunately, begins as most uh, American uh, relationships begin with movies, which is as a casual consumer. Um, but. Over time, as I've become more, um, let's say, well-versed in the literary perspective, um, I've started to notice that movies have their, um, their place in literature. Um, not only necessarily as a new medium for literature to be played out in, but also because, and I think I've talked to you about this, Dwayne, uh, one of my favorite writers who actually has bearing on this movie um, H.L. Mencken, who in this movie is represented by E.K. Hornbeck, and we'll get to that. Um, he not only found a literary canon for the United States of America, um, which has long been neglected. Um, he was, uh, a lot of the writers he was able to help kind of find their way onto the scene in, a, in America became a uh, uh, writers for movies. Uh, for example, Aldous Huxley, mm -hmm. uh, Dorothy Parker, uh, H.L. Minken actually inspired a movie by Anita Luz uh, oh, interesting. called um, Oh, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on this. Um, no, fine. But um, <clears throat> I want to say um, it's something like um, Blonde Girls Have More Fun or something like that. It's a uh, um, it's a, it's a movie that Minkin inspired by basically ignoring Anita Luz on a train for a little bit. That's interesting. Um, but no, you, you're so, not, you're not referring to, you're not referring to the movie with, um, um, Marilyn Monroe and, uh, I might be, uh, Jane, um, Dennis, help me out here. Not Jane uh, Mansfield. Uh, uh, gentlemen prefer gentlemen prefer blondes. Gentlemen there it is. Yep, there it is. That's it. Yeah, That's it. Uh, yeah. All right, yeah. gentlemen yeah. prefer blondes. There it is. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I, I remember that. because she wrote it first as a book, yeah. um, which actually which actually Minkin uh, promoted. Um, it was interesting that he was able to see that she was basically making fun of him, and he still promoted it because it's it's a good book. It's a good book. Yeah, uh, and and, it, and that movie is actually a Technicolor masterpiece. Uh, right. Yeah. Exactly, and so. Um, as you learn more about writers, I guess, uh, is the, the long short of it here is that um, 
they become, you know, you start to realize that writers um, are applicable to all sorts of mediums, mm-hmm. and especially in this case, movies. Now, the other reason can I, 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 I can sorry. I, can I, yeah, go ahead. Just Absolutely. for a second, I think one thing that is interesting about Hollywood history is that writers were kind of pissed on. It's like, mm-hmm. we don't really need you. Mm-hmm. And yes. the writers were in turn pissed off because it's mm-hmm. like we've been ruling the world, the, the cultural world for uh, a few centuries in now. And so, you know, what, what, what do you mean you don't need us? Right. Mm-hmm. And these, yeah. these, these mega producers out here, uh, I'm in Los Angeles, yeah. they were like, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. we don't need you. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, um, I, that's what I was actually about to sort of get to that because the other re other relationship I have to movies here is, uh, through Gore Vidal, who, as we know, wrote uh, several movies like a visit to a small planet and Ben Hur. Um, he Myra did it. Ac- Sorry, go ahead. Myra Breckenridge. Oh yes. Myra. Well, he hated that movie and he disavowed it and he said he never wrote for it, which turns really? out to be true. Yeah. Uh, and well, he, he wrote the book, but he didn't write the movie um, because he wrote Myron Brecker Ridge and then he followed up with the book Myron. Um, he also was credited with Caligula, hmm. although he also he, he sought to litigation because he did not write that. That either. was the that was the penthouse movie. Yes. Yes, oh, I didn't know that. Really, right, right, and so, um, but Gore Vidal has an interesting relationship to movies because, as you were pointing out, a lot of the uh, places were kind of pissing on writers. Um, he used to make fun of the idea of the film Auteur, which he apparently thought was the most ridiculous concept ever, mm. uh, which we still have today. Yeah. Um, and it makes even less sense, actually. Right. Yeah, and he. Uh, his his uh let's call it his literary sort of archetype the wise hack which i've appropriated as part of the persona i have for writing mm-hmm. um was kind of an embodiment of what the writer had become the movie industry mm-hmm. which is uh somebody who was cynical somebody who was interested in liter literature and stuff but yeah. had to kind of condense their work Yes. to fit certain tropes that were that were popping up in cinema. Yes. Um, for example, he he notes the white the wise hack who apparently was a real person. Um, I don't know who it is. Nobody knows who it is. Um, but he noted that the wise hack, like you know, would point out that um, the best way to hook somebody in a movie is to begin it with children being in trouble, for example. Mm-hmm. And basically, the wise hack was more or less teaching the writers. Yeah, you've got some good ideas. Yeah, as Dennis said, you're running the world here for a little bit, but you got to fit these cinematic tropes so that we can sell these movies. So, in other words, how to write for movies. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And okay. luckily, you know, movies moved out of those tropes, mm-hmm. um, cinema particularly. So that's good. Um, but that that's kind of my relationship to the movies is, is mm-hmm. um, my relationship is through writers who eventually had to become uh, uh, writers for movies. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Dorothy Parker is probably the supreme wit of all American literature, if not mm-hmm. worldly. She's definitely compared to Oscar Wilde, but um, she had to, to write movies. And I forget which movie she wrote um, on. Um, as did Aldous Huxley. Because it became a way, um, and for the audience who may be, impa- it may be impatient and saying, wait a minute, I thought we were supposed to be talking about Inherit the Wind. What's going on here? <laughs> Don't, yeah, never fear. We, I, I will indeed, um, uh, we will indeed be getting to that at, uh, in a few moments. But it, it's interesting to me that um, um, you coming to this, coming to cinema through writing, and and also Dennis, with your your perspective as well of the relationship, the business relationship between writers and producers and studios, both the the structured studio system of the er, the first half of the twenty twentieth century, and and the corporate um, system, the neoliberal system that we have today, actually, well, neoliberal is not quite correct, but um, but a film industry that has been 
re-engineered for the post 1970s era um, um, because Disney is a very different entity as a corporation from what MGM was or, or RKO um, in, in the way that it operates. Anyway, that the attempt to turn writers into uh, sweatshop uh, workers essentially um, and it's quite interesting because you do need stories. You have to have stories. And so it's kind of a triumph of these business people to, con to, to wage this war. It's a war on labor, really. A war on a, a type of creative labor. Well, not a type of. It is creative labor to write. Um, and to turn them into um, uh, sweatshop workers, essentially. But then writers, of course, want to write. And, so, but, and you have to be able to eat. You have to pay your bills. You may have you know, family responsibilities or just you yourself, you need to eat whether you have right. kids or not. And, um, and so the, the movie industry arises and then becomes a way for a very few to become, you know, quite well off um, and for others to have steady income, having to bend themselves and their creative pursuits to fit the, the, uh, the constraints of an industry. And sometimes art could emerge from that um, and, but a lot of the time, of course, you know, it's just, uh, workmanlike stuff. And, and I guess we can debate later in, or in a subsequent program. And I think this is a good topic, actually, the extent to which, uh, creativity, um, is necessary in the main, like for the audience and, and, and is not, um, but what I wanted to do now before we got too can far, I'll oh, go I ahead. Yes, please do. Uh, Charles mentioned children and movies. Yeah. Uh, I said that I lived in this uh, movie theater in my hometown. Mm -hmm. I, I'll tell a quick story here. One night I was at a party and I had a headache. And I, I was complaining about this headache. And somebody gave me a pill. And I said, what is this? And they said, uh, yeah, just take it. And I said, Can, no, tell me what it is. And they said, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. So I don't know if this person didn't like me, if they thought it was funny. They gave me something that was just incredibly potent. Some, I, it was some kind of psych pill or something. I don't know. So anyway, hmm. I don't know how I got back. To, we were out in the country. Uh, and I don't know how I got back to town. But I end up uh, in a convenience store and I barely made it out of there without passing out and probably having the law called on me. Yeah. And then I get outside and I see um, a distant cousin of mine and I said, hey, give me a ride to the Royal Theater. And they're like, it's closed. And I'm like, don't worry about it. I live there. Hmm. So they take me to the theater and it turns out I don't have my key. So I have to go into a side entrance and the side entrance to get into the theater, I had to crawl through an air duct from, from the uh, HVAC system. Oh my God. So, <laughs> so I, I'm telling you, this is a true story. How can I make this up? So oh I, get into, I get into this air duct and I pass out. Yeah. And I wake up hours later. This was a Friday night. I wake up hours later on a Saturday uh, to the sound of giggling children. And I'm like, what? of course, I'm like, what the fuck? Where am I? And uh, I was in the air duct. And uh, it was a Saturday afternoon matinee for kids. So it was kids movies. And I'm I there was nothing I could do. I just went back. Yeah. To in the fucking air duct. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> with a with a theater full of you know children laughing. At the film. Howling children. It's just howling children. <laughs> That's like a situation that you know, like uh, you could uh, W C Fields would, would describe that as hell, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, I will actually read now a synopsis, and this is from uh, mm. this is from Wikipedia. Um, for Inherit the Wind, because that's uh, the ostensible topic of today's show. And um, if you will indulge me, I will read this now. Um, so, Inherit the Wind is a 1960 American film <clears throat> based on the 1955 play of the same name, written by Jerome Lawrence and Robert Edwin Lee. The film was directed by Stanley Kramer, 
It stars Spencer Tracy as lawyer Henry Drummond and Frederick March as his friend and rival, Matthew Harrison Brady. It also features Gene Kelly, Dick York of Bewitch fame, Harry Morgan, Donna Anderson, Claude Aikens, Noah Beery, uh, Jr., that is, Florence Eldridge, and Jimmy Boyd. The plot, in a nutshell, in the small southern town of Hillsboro in the 1920s, a school teacher, Bertram Cates, is about to stand trial for teaching Darwinism, which is a violation of state law. Cates is denounced by town leaders, including Reverend Jeremiah Brown. The town is excited because Matthew Brady, a noted statesman and three-time presidential candidate, will be assisting in the prosecution of Cates, a staunch foe of evolution and a biblical scholar. Brady will sit beside the prosecuting attorney, Tom Davenport, in the courtroom of Judge Coffey. Now, I should note that this is based loosely upon an actual trial that occurred in 1925 in the state of Tennessee, um, uh, the so-called Scopes Monkey Trial, which is just fire, very funny to me. And now, let me read uh, briefly this excerpt from the Wikipedia article about the Scopes Trial. Um, so the Scopes Trial, formerly the state of Tennessee versus John Thomas Scopes, and commonly referred to as the Scopes Monkey Trial, was an American legal case from July 10th to July 21st, 1925, in which a high school teacher, John T. Scopes, was accused of violating Tennessee's Butler Act, which had made it illegal for teachers to teach human evolution in any state-funded school. The trial was deliberately staged, this is quite fascinating to me, in order to attract publicity to the small town of Dayton, Tennessee. Yeah, that, I, love that. I love that detail. Yeah, it's, it's really quite, quite something. Scopes was unsure whether he had ever actually taught evolution. Uh, and Charles mentioned to me um, before we started recording that he was a math teacher. So in all likelihood, he was not. <laughs> but he incriminated himself deliberately so the case could have a defendant. The and trial... I, remember, I remember reading that the person who initiated the idea was from New York. I so what I read was that actually it was the ACLU um, in its in earlier incarnation that uh, that uh, came up with this concept um, in cooperation with uh, some of the town leaders um, of the town because it seemed to be a win win that ACLU would uh, get some notoriety and do a test case um, and the town of course uh, as was its objective would get get the notoriety well, and let me just. Have... Uh, the thing about the town, uh, getting back to my uh, Royal Theater story, is it was about the same size as my hometown, around 7,000 people. Interesting. Yeah. 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 So we're talking about Dayton, Tennessee, uh, a very small town. Yeah. yeah. Very small town. Now, let me read this, this one detail, which I, mm. I found quite fascinating, um, about the trial itself. Um, again, this is from uh, Wikipedia. The trial publicized the fundamentalist modernist controversy, which set modernist, who said evolution was not inconsistent with religion, against fundamentalist, who said the word of God, as revealed in the Bible, took priority over all human knowledge. The case was thus seen both as a theological contest and as a trial on whether evolution should be taught in schools. And this is, this is fascinating to me because... Um, in the modern context, um, and by modern context, I mean in 2022, uh, whatever remains of it, um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be this subtle. It would be, oh, I believe in God and you don't. It wouldn't be, well, we both believe in God, but I happen to also think that you know, Darwin was correct about how you know, um, uh, human life came to be um, and you don't. Okay? Um, and, and that... So you're, you're talking about the same ideological plane, um, but just different interpretations or different, um, different uh, emphases on that ideological plane. Whereas today, like with the CRT debate, or not, well, it's not a debate, but the attack on the idea of teaching actual US history, um, uh, which has been coached as an anti-CRT de um, debate, um, the idea is that um, th there's absolutism um, as opposed to any de de degree of nuance Whatsoever. Yeah, I, 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 I watched it last night again and the town meeting when they're deciding mm -hmm. when, they're, when they're talking about, oh, we're being laughed at. Yes. And then there's the realization, oh, 
uh, when uh, the William Bryant character is uh, what's the what's the character's name that the William Matt Brady. Brady. Matt Brady. When it's when in, when they see a headline that Matt Brady is coming, then they get very excited about oh this is this is going to be great for us. Uh -huh. Anyway, that meeting, all these white men leaders, mm -hmm. uh, they somehow seem more intelligent than the people who are leading us now. Yes, it's quite fascinating that they and seem I don't know to be. They, I don't know if that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. They seem to be politically savvy. Uh, in other words, their their yeah. goal wasn't to ex it wasn't to destroy their opponents so much as in a very American way. How can we benefit from this? Mm. Yeah, and, and and so in a way, I th our I think our our current crop of fundamentalists are uh, how can I put this? They've lost a certain American spirit of opportunism. They just want power. And, and I think that that's the difference because, you know, like a, a P.T. Barnum is a person who probably wouldn't advocate for your extermination. He just tried to find a way to exploit you. But um, our current crop seem to actually want to exterminate. And, and I think this, this is this is the the difference. Not we that this. Devo. Yeah, apparently, yes, there is indeed de evolution. And as I think, uh, Gore, uh, well, it was John Gray, a philosopher, John Gray, observed in a um, um, in a. A video that Charles shared with me, um, barbarism is is always is always there. It's always around the corner. You know, there there is no permanent human um, victories in this area. But again, we're going far afield. Charles, you actually, <laughs> you, you, you yeah, actually, I, you know, we should get back. I, I guess it, it, H. L. Mencken is key here, of course. Yes, so absolutely. Why don't you go there? Yes. Yeah. So. <clears throat> I was gonna, the, the reason I brought up H.L. Mencken and the writers before is that it's actually going to all tie in here. Um, but to start with H.L. Mencken, so H.L. Mencken was the media, um, so to speak. Well, he was one of them um, who popularized this uh, Scopes trial. He was the one who came up with the term, the monkey trial, actually. And I don't know if Mencken was aware that it was all set up. But Minkin was the one who gave it the theological flavor of um, this is between the fundamentalists and the modernists. And H.L. Minkin, who in the movie is portrayed by E.K. Hornbeck. Um, Gene he, Kelly. Yeah, Gene Kelly. And he's he which is which is generous to say the least. Um to, to Minkin. Yes, I know. It's like, oh well. We, <laughs> well we, we, well we Minkin Minkin described himself once as looking like a brewer's son. Um he also defended himself <laughs> to a friend who said that he was getting fat and he said that I like being fat and that he needed to mind his own business. <laughs> and so to have Gene Kelly, who's obviously very athletic and very well built representing. Very charismatic. Yeah. 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 I mean, Gene Kelly is so charismatic that like 60 years later, he's still charismatic. Right. On, on exactly. Screen. Exactly. And having him represent the misanthropic cantankerous Minkin, who it was rumored was almost a run out of town because people were tired of the things he was writing um, is interesting, to say the least. But uh, Mingan's role in the Scopes trial sort of parallels E.K. Hornbeck, except for the fact that Mingan had way more influence on how that trial was looked at, because I believe the Baltimore Sun was one of the organizations in contact with the ACLU. Uh, I think they're the ones who suggested that Clarence Darrow, uh, who is paralleled by Henry Drummond, um, that he was he should be the one that they should send down there. Um, Minkin also influences it in the sense that Minkin absolutely, a hundred percent hated William Jennings Bryan, who was in the trial, and it was Minkin's efforts to paint. Brian in a certain light as a fundamentalist um, that made the it, he made the trial interesting um, more so I think than the trial actually was um, if you had all the facts um, 
but the way that this relates, um, I guess, to the movie, um, and the way all of this kind of comes to a head, is the most interesting fact about this movie is that as a dramatization of the Scopes trial, it was actually a parable for the anti-communist McCarthyism that was going on at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the one of the writers, and this is why I bring up the writers earlier and everything, and this is all going to come together here. Nedrick Young was a writer who had to use the uh, nom de plume of um, Nathan E. Douglas because he was uh, blacklisted. He was not supposed to be writing for anything because he was supposedly a communist. And um, that's what makes the movie interesting and also allows it to kind of deviate from the Scopes trial. Because the Scopes trial was definitely about the legality of being able to stop people from teaching evolution in conjunction with religion, as you pointed out even if Minkin was saying that it's the teaching of science at all. But um, the movie is more based on, as Henry Drummond says many times, it's about the right to think, which gives the movie itself a a sort of a... It's it's a very dramatic, very thematic uh, kind of flavoring. Did you say, you said earlier a parable, right? A parable, yes. Yeah, you know, I have a note here on a post-it. I said uh, last night, I'm like, is this a fable? Yeah, it's it's pretty close because mm-hmm. it, 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 because uh, Henry Drummond is supposed to be Clarence Darrow. Uh, they have it's it's interesting the way they mix myth and fact because mm-hmm. there's facts in there that are definitely from the trial. For example, mm-hmm. the suspenders. Or having to take off the jackets. That's well, actually... What is, happen- the, uh, what is the word he uses? It's a wonderful word. Um, uh, keep going. I'll find it. Okay. Um, but yeah, there's the uh, the suspenders that uh, Henry Drummond's wearing. Uh, Matthew Brady eating a whole bunch, having a little picnic basket was a part of the case. Um and the and if you notice the the uh, monocle the the pins notes that's in his pocket was actually very much a William Jenning Bryan thing. Um, the son, you know, uh, Gene Kelly, uh, his entrance, he's eating an apple. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. That that's the mythical part that I've always found interesting is the way they kind of th- there's there's a difference in my opinion between developing. <laughs> developing somebody beyond the facts of their personality and caricature caricature is you know it, it's the it's the um purposeful degrading of something in order to make it comical or to make it stupid um but what they do with the characters that are excuse me very much based off of different you know real life people is they build them up to fit a sort of symbolism each, each one of the characters, and this is why I said we can go about this for like three hours, because each <laughs> one of the characters represents something different. Henry Drummond represents a, a agnostic who is willing to say that religion and evolution can go together. If you notice at the end of the movie, he has both the origin of species in the Bible. Yes, and he together. puts them together. Yeah. And it's and like, he he's, them. he's like, he's weighing them equally in, in his, in his hands. Yeah. Right. And then yeah, you have that's like a minute long, that scene. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, <clears throat> and then you have EK Hornbeck who gives his nice little speech about the monkey at the top of the totem pole, right before Henry Drummond comes up with the idea of putting Matt Brady on the stand um, in the hotel room. Um, you know, EK Hornbeck represents kind of the more dogmatically atheist, um, almost anti-human um, position of um, atheism. And which is interesting to go off on a small tangent here. That was actually William Jennings Bryan's biggest concern about this case. That's why he got involved. It wasn't about evolution mm-hmm. as much as his fear that evolution would move would, would would destroy the tenets of humanism. This is an interesting point because in earlier ages of American expressions of Christianity, there was, um, if I if my reading of history is correct, 
a greater willingness to accept um, the, the findings of science. Um, as when you read documents from 1920s in particular, 1930s, 1940s, there were ministers, reverends, priests, rabbis who were, um, who were saying, probably imams as well, though I don't know how, the penetration of Islam in, in the States at that time, but um, who were absolutely saying that we are living in a modern age and science is discovering all these things, but we, but we must not forget God. This, this was, and indeed, um, when I, I grew up in a small church in West Philadelphia, and the minister, um, he was trained in the 1940s. So he continued to carry that message into the 1980s, right? Which was, he never, he was never a science denier, whatever that might mean. And in fact, one of the things he did in our church was encourage myself and a friend of mine. One of our interests was uh, atomic weapons, which I, I won't even go into that. But, um, but we were, and he- Did he, you build rockets? We did build rockets, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, we, we did not tip them with uh, <laughs> atomic ordinance, but yes, <laughs> we, we did build rockets. Um, but he, 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 he encouraged us by letting us do quite unusually uh, a presentation before the church during one of the after, uh, you know, the, the after service uh, events for, for young people. And we, we found some old newsreel footage of uh, video, but in VHS of atomic tests. And we did diagrams of how, what was known publicly about the workings of atomic weapons and the fission fusion cycle for H-bombs. Now this is quite, this is mad. I mean, you think about it, it's quite, it, it's beautiful in a way um, that, uh, that a, a, a Christian minister would be so concerned about um, encouraging, you know, the, the inquisitiveness of two young people in his, under, under his care um, uh, as parishioners, that he would say, yes, I, I, it's probably many of the parishioners would be like, why in the world are these two 14-year-olds telling us about how H-bombs work? Um, but he was very much of that era of, you know, yes, I believe in the divinity of Christ and all these things, but clearly science and technology are doing things. Right. And I, th I think okay. that that was reflected um, in the, the actual trial itself. I have a, a similar story. Uh, uh, were you, are you talking about a Baptist church? This was Seventh-day Adventist, but it was run according to Baptist, but, but it was basically like a Baptist church. Yeah, so I, I grew up Southern Baptist in mm -hmm. Oklahoma. And uh, when I was in the sixth grade, well, first of all, let me talk about the minister. The minister was uh, an Air Force officer, mm -hmm. uh, retired Air Force um and he was very he was a very intellectual guy mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the only way i can describe it mm -hmm. and um when i was in sixth grade i um was trying to get people to go to what they called vacation bible school yes i remember this yeah summertime so i'm passing out flyers and stuff i got called into the principal's office and I was told I could not do that because of, he didn't say this exactly, but it was separation of church and state. Yeah. Can you imagine that happening now? Which meant that I he would be encouraged to hand exactly. out these players. So despite his belief, he took his civic duty seriously. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. And then the, the, the minister that followed the air force colonel or whatever he was, was a uh, fire and brimstone kind of guy. I remember him yeah. preaching against uh, Jesus Christ superstar. He, he's not a superstar. <laughs> he's a savior. You know? <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, the, I mean, it's, the, a, it's different now. Yes. The, well, and, and that's the great thing about this movie is like this whole conversation is taking place by um, characterization within the movie. Um, because as I was saying, you know, you have uh, mm -hmm. E.K. Hornbeck as the dogmatic sort of atheist. Um, and then you have Matt Brady, who is a fundamentalist. But what's interesting about each one of these characters is they have a certain amount of doubt against their own position. Um, like Matthew Brady yes. in the middle of the movie where they're having the get together of the town and that guy is kind of going fire brimstone and 
stuff like that. And Matthew Brady has to stop him and say, you know, isn't God also forgiving? You know, doesn't God also forgive sin? Um, and, you know, you, then you have, for example, Henry Drummond um, getting frustrated <clears throat> with, um, you know, the jury selection and the way that the courts were definitely against him because um, as in real life, as in the actual case, um, in the movie, um, everything is argued about legality, uh, how things adhere to the law. And the law was, well, you can't teach that. And so Henry Drummond was finding himself, you know, more and more frustrated. And, you know, you see him kind of doubting um, out loud kind of the religious aspect of life. Um, but this, uh, you know, the sort of mixture of religion and science is very is very interesting in this movie because we've had a lot of movies nowadays that are either super Christian like the you know the God is not dead series that's ridiculous um, and then you have movies that are definitely you know very against religion in and of itself and it's it's interesting to watch a movie that that has characters specifically advocating for certain things but it can also undercut these yes. you know you know these uh proclamations with a movie that can carry this out uh as kind of you know getting each character to doubt itself eventually they all kind of doubt themselves in yeah. co close to the end and this shows where... that, and this shows that they're all thinking right exactly and they kind of, you know, you kind of see this, you know, when when Brady has his heart attack at, at towards the end. And isn't that what really happened? He did die, and and uh, so so that's actually a funny little side thing. William Jennings Bryan did die. He did not die in court. He died, uh, I want to say, like a week later. Yeah. Um, yes, it was about and, five days later. And, yeah. Yeah, and and it's true that when Minkin heard and was asked how brian died he did say from a busted stomach which ek hornbeck says um it's also true that hl minkin tried to claim credit for having killed uh William yeah. <laughs> oh my god um, wait say that again he tried hl H H minkin tried to take credit for the death <laughs> of william jennings brian um he and he wrote he wrote an obituary to the baltimore sun and he had to rewrite it three times because it was so cruel. Almost, it was. It was. He hated William Jennings Bryan. Um, but in the final, um, in the final version of it, they finally accepted it. And part of that was saying that his writings had caused the death of William Jennings Bryan. Oh and so. As you can see, wow. you know, Mink and the Misanthrope definitely comes out in that because he, he had a certain very, uh, very uh, significant hatred of people. But he also, and this is uh, interesting with E.K. Hornbeck, um, and it's kind of parallel a little bit. Mink and didn't like people who were bigots, mm -hmm. which is oddly interesting. You know, we can go into Mink and uh, some other time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but he didn't like people he considered to be bigots, and he considered William Jin Bryan to be a big, uh, to be a bigot. Um, he also kind of related bigotry to the masses, to the the Christian masses who just hated whatever they were told to hate. Um, and you kind of see that played out in the movie. But what I like about the movie and its ability towards nuance is that Matthew Brady. Is and this is why a little side thing to add. Uh, Roger Ebert wrote a review of this, which I actually kind of dispute. I, I understand where he's coming from, but he talked about Brady being presented as a buffoon, and I don't think he is. I think he's presented as kind of a um, proselytizing <clears throat> guy, but I think he's presented. You know, like for example, the the scene I was telling everyone about about the group of Christians that are all getting more and more and more hateful. Mm -hmm. And then Matthew Brady steps in. He's like, you know, we should, you know, think about forgiveness. You know, he talks um, about uh, Psalms and Solomon and. Right. And he's the one who quotes the, 
the uh, mm-hmm. proverb that became the title of the movie, which is Inherit the Wind. Inherit the Wind. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. And so it's, you know, it's, it's a great movie because of the way that it's able to be nuanced um, while also having characters that are interesting while having a, you know, because this could have been a very dull movie. Um, and it's not, you know, you know I just, uh, I noticed, uh, I watched it again last night, like I said, and I noticed that scene with the Claude Aikens, the, the preacher and the, that's the most highly sort of produced scene. Mm-hmm. Right. There's, 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 mm-hmm. there's like this kind of spooky background and, yes close-ups on the faces of the people you know and uh, you know it's a very it's very uh, cinema a pure cinema in the hitchcock sense yeah 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 exactly absolutely yeah and um but i i do want to put in something here because um it looks like we have about 15 minutes mm-hmm. um i want to talk about this movie sort of as as the par- parable for the mccarthyism which was yes. going on at the time um what I like about it is not only the insistence on focusing, you know, Henry Drummond's trying to defend somebody's right to think. And I really enjoy that part in the uh, courtroom where he's talking and he asks um, Brady if he knows anything about sponges. And Brady's like, I don't know any, you know, uh, I'm trying to quote it exactly. He goes, does a sponge think? And he goes, I don't know anything about a sponge. If God wants a sponge to think, then a sponge thinks. Yeah, and and, and uh, I'm I'm more interested in uh, the rock of ages than the age of rocks. Yes, that that's one thing that's always interesting about Brady is is they present the politician as kind of this platitudinal kind of. he's it's very very superficial sometimes um especially his jokes trying to deflect everything he talked about because as a soundbite for an audience it's perfect yes but but it's meaningless exactly and and that's what's great again this is why i said we could talk about this for like three hours but as a parable for the right to think i i appreciated that that's where the movie goes um because the movie starts out with the very slowed down version of uh, old time religion, which I think is uh, who who sings it. Tennessee Leslie Ernie. Uggams. Leslie Uggams. Oh, oh yeah. Um, I, I thought the original was like Tennessee Ernie Ford or something like that. But yes, you're right. That's the one who that that's the person who sings it. Yeah, who was? Uh, I, I found out uh, just the other night uh, was a star on the Lawrence Welk show. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> when she was um, a she was a child star. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 th- I think I think she became really famous uh, as a, an a- actor in uh, Roots. Oh, but, uh, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's yeah. Interesting. and but, that's when Le- that's when Leslie Ogden uh, came to my notice. Was, was right, it, so. right. Um, well, it. But what I find interesting is that at the beginning, you have the slowed down version of the song Old Time Religion. And so it definitely could have been taken, you know, the the movie could have definitely taken various different, very dogmatic Mm -hmm. themes and kind of set it as a a fluke, kind of a, uh, you know, this is a pretty okay movie if you agree with the theme. But it was able to work through all of that. It was able to work through you know, different dogmas while still being able to present kind of a fullness to it. Um, But as a parable to um, McCarthyism, um, I found it interesting that it was able to maintain... (laughs) I I like the way it showed the influence of politics in the courtroom. Like when the the mayor gets called up to give... um, Henry Drummond, the the temporary honorable, temporary honorary. honorary, yeah, temporary honorary <laughs> title of colonel, or when he steps up to the court and he tells the court, "Hey, listen, you know, let's, you know, maybe, maybe let's drop this, maybe let's, you know, lessen, like trying to influence how the court, you know, made its decision." I love Harry Morgan. Yeah. Right. And and. But what I I enjoyed the most as a parable anyway is even though the judge 
is sort of influenced by the politician in the sense that he he only finds the guy a hundred dollars. He also um, remains forthright on his what the decision he was going to come up to, because as you rem- as you might remember, the mayor was like, "Hey, let's like you know." I forgot what he said exactly. I don't think he said like dismiss the case, but like maybe rule in the favor of the teacher or something like that. I forget exactly what he said, but the judge maintains his sort of uh, position, which in itself is honorable. He just changes how much he finds the guy, but it's, it's an interesting look at the inner workings of the judicial and the political where, you know, for McCarthyism, you know, I don't think that that was the case. I think everything was pretty overwrought. But... Yeah, exactly. It was all because it because there was no actual legal proceeding. Right. It, it was it was right. It was pure. It was pure show trial. And so yeah. and, and there and there was no no standard of evidence, for example. It was or, extra you know, extra judicial. Exactly, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. And so it's interesting how they're able to excuse me, play this out where the judge is brought into kind of a sympathetic light, even though he's not really ruling in favor of what maybe people would want him to rule. At least he was taking that hard line against political, you know, meddling, so to speak. Well, Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, that's it. That was the end. This gets to uh, the thing I sent uh, yesterday about the judge and the historian. Um, we're and we're at fifty two minutes. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, so, so let me. I, I can I, maybe I can do it this way. I can tell a a, a real life story. That'd be good. Um, the there's the scene where um, Gene Kelly throws tosses the Bible to Spencer Tracy and he smiles and realizes oh. Here's a here's an here's an angle. I can talk to him about the Bible. So I worked a case. I, I didn't mention earlier my profession is I'm a uh, an investigator working in criminal defense. I've been doing it for about 20 years, and, and I was working a case in 2013, a capital case, a death penalty case, and. Um, Essentially, with those kinds of cases, you have two trials. You have a trial to uh, determine guilt or innocence, and then you have a trial to determine the penalty. Because apart from capital cases, I think this is the same all across the country, but certainly in California, in a capital case, uh, the jury that decides guilt um, also decides the penalty. So we were working the penalty phase. So it was, like I say, kind of like a second trial. So anyway, there were two uh, defendants. It was a murder trial, and there were two defendants. We were representing one guy. So I attended uh, closing arguments on the other guy. And the prosecutor used Kant, a a, a very simple one sentence phrase, uh, hmm. one sentence quote from from Kant. I've been hmm. trying to find it. I can't find it exactly, but I remember she said it, it had to do with uh, what do you call it? The categorical uh, imperative. Yes. Of, uh, we don't do these things because we should, but because we must. I, I was looking for the precise quote. I know that Kant is all over the place in legal uh, discussions. So she must have heard this in law school. I don't know. So anyway, uh, I bring it up in a meeting for our guy, and everybody's nobody pays attention to me. Um, and then at the 11th hour, the attorney says, hey, what about that Kant stuff? And... <laughs> So I, we sent some quotes about Kant, about, you know, um, uh, I think there was one that was, it's your duty to uh, report a runaway slave, something like that. Anyway, it worked. Um, and the, the prosecutor, who is now a judge, mm-hmm. 
Uh, she said objection and uh, relevance. And um, the judge said, well, it's, you know, it's, it's not evidence. It's closing arguments. So, you know, we're talking about a Los Angeles jury. And you're talking about a German philosopher who says, yeah, you know, you got to turn in a runaway slave. Mm-hmm. It worked. Mm-hmm. So that's very similar to what Spencer Tracy did in this movie. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah. The, the the quote that I gave last night was from a book called "The Judge and the Historian," which I highly recommend. We're, we're running out of time, but it's by Carlo. Mm-hmm. Um, should I read the quote I sent last night? I think we have enough time for that. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just do it right now. Um, as I said, the the book is called "The Judge and the Historian." Basically, uh, this is a very personal book by Carlo Ginsburg, who is just an amazing amazing historian and uh his career has been uh writing about uh basically uh uh he he used a lot of inquisition uh testimony Mm. transcripts which he got access to uh they had been uh the vatican the the vatican had not let people look at these oh Uh, my wow but he fascinating yeah so I look him up, Carlo Ginsberg. Mm-hmm. Um, this book, The Judge and the Historian, is about a friend of his uh, was a leftist in uh, Italy who was prosecuted for something that Ginsberg believes he's uh, not guilty of. Mm-hmm. Uh, I won't say anymore. Just look it up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm going to read this. Um, the ties between history and law have always been close. They date back 2,500 years to the emergence in Greece of the literary genre we call history. While the word history, historia, derives from medical parlance, the reasoning skills it implies derive from the field of law. History as a specific intellectual activity was founded at the intersection of medicine and rhetoric. Mm -hmm. History examines cases and situations seeking out their natural causes an emulation of medicine. History then sets them forth in accordance with the rules of rhetoric and art of persuasion developed in the courtroom. So, end quote. That is actually quite germane, I think, to the, to the, to the case itself, but also to the movie's representation um, of, the, of the case, because it, it's quite obvious that there is um, an intersection of... Uh, culture history and law because there was the actual uh, law that was uh, allegedly broken um, but then that law is being interpreted within a cultural context which is the specific time and place Um, and then of course this has history as well and then I to that I would also add science but science is is a historic occurs within history itself because what is considered science at one time in history is not considered science in another, you know, we no longer consider alchemy to be a science, you know, um, for example, um, even though there are probably things alchemists, a few things alchemists are probably able to figure out that we're closer to ke- to chemistry than, than we're willing to admit today. Well, I mean, yeah, medicine. Imagine, you know, you yeah, remember the old science. Steve Martin thing on Saturday Night Live? With, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when Saturday Night Live was still good, you know. <laughs> uh, I mean, medicine was a medicine was a. I mean, it was it, it, ad hoc, ad hoc uh, yeah, rules of yeah, thumb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite, yeah. quite, quite uh, more, more of uh, a guessing game, and and and. Uh, I think, uh, I think the way Voltaire, together. the way Voltaire put it was, uh, the doctor gives you medicine while the body makes you better, <laughs> um, or something like that. Um, so, well, but yeah. Charles, would I like as we close up? I would like to give you um, an opportunity to to sum up. Um, what you see as the significance of this film from whatever perspective um, <clears throat> you like, and as they do on television uh, all the time. And, you know, uh, can you please describe the work of Hegel in 30 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man. Uh, oh, Hegel. 
I like Schopenhauer, so sometimes, you know. Well, we'll have to have no. when you finally when you finally get your ass to Europe, we'll have to have a nice <laughs> drink over the uh, Hegel versus Hegel versus Schopenhauer. Right. Um but as far as kind of summarizing this, um I would argue that Inherit the Wind is a is a I'd say it's pure <clears throat> excuse me, I, I'd consider it um one of the pinnacles of cinema. Um, hmm. It's way of addressing technological changes. For example, the changing, you know, they put the big um, speaker there for the radio mm -hmm. at, towards the end. Um, the way it deals with religion, the, mm -hmm. the way it deals with the law, the way it deals with, you know, personal conflicts. Um, hell, it even deals with uh, romance and the, you know, mm -hmm. the uh, precarious nature of that in the face of, um, <clears throat> you know, stress. someone going to jail. Yes, yeah. Right. But then, and, but then the way it's able to be nuanced, for example, the, the, the teacher, when he goes to jail, he doesn't really go to jail. He, he's playing cards with the jailer mm -hmm. or, you know, Matthew Brady kind of looking at the fundamentalist and be like, okay, hold on, stop. <laughs> this is, this is a little too much. Um, you know, E.K. Hornbeck, you know, I think he's the only character that doesn't necessarily change. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's hard to explain exactly. Um, yeah, no, you, you know, I think you're I think you're right. That's there's mm -hmm. that uh, the scene at the end where uh, Spencer Tracy is kind of dressing him down. Yeah, and uh, he says, uh, "You'll be there to save me." Mm -hmm. Right, pretty much, and then I'm not, you know, not going to change. Basically, mm -hmm. right. Right, and and then you have uh, Spencer Tracy, who his character, you know, changes kind of from finding religion to be a bit, you know, he, he respects it, but not quite to, you mm -hmm. know, you know, believing that both evolution and religion can work together and kind mm -hmm. of stuff like that. Um, it's a movie that deals with so many different things from so many different angles in a way that. <clears throat> You know, you don't see nowadays. Um, it's why mm -hmm. in that whole Marvel versus, uh, I always say his name wrong, uh, Sarkozy. Um, Scors uh, Scorsese. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I never say it right. Um, <laughs> but, but that whole battle, I'll, I'll put it mm -hmm. this way, that whole battle between Marvel and the idea of cinema, that's yeah. why I always you know, side with Marvel not being cinema. Because movies like this are the movies where there's so much going on. Yeah. And there's so many different ways it works out, and mm -hmm. it's done with with wonderful production, yeah. um, right down to the music and how the music plays itself out um, in relation to how the camera, you know, mm -hmm. moves, like at the um, at the rally and mm -hmm. all these, you know, that's cinema. It's yes. something where it's it's such an art, yeah, that it can be viewed from very various different perspectives. Ver Sorry, let me try that again. Various different perspectives, mm -hmm. and there it, it's inexhaustible almost yeah. about how it can be looked at. Well, great great works of art do tend to be like that, right? You 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 can return to the the proverbial well multiple times and then find something new um, each time. Well, gentlemen, I think we have done our first show, and um, we've only gone a little bit over an hour because we're trying to be disciplined with our own time and dis and and not uh, overindulgent with our audience's time that's one of our principles of film conversations uh thank you for your your time thank you for your insights um i don't know what our next film is going to be but uh, dennis i would like you to pick it i think that would be good and then we will um, I can do that and then we will discuss and come up with some some excellent insights and some good conversation um i will have show notes to um for everyone about uh inherit the wind uh both the 1960 film and the play upon which it's based and the trial and uh, i hope to see everyone the next time and uh, um i should i should have my review of the movie out here. yes i should yes thank you i actually thank yeah. you for reminding so me good. because your review will be posted on on the website in addition to in right. addition to substack 
You're what driving. about, uh, should I send like links to that book I was mentioning? This is, uh, yes, anything that you think is germane. The judge and, and the historian, right here. Please do, yeah. Anything you think is germane, I will include in the show notes. And also, I will include in our website, which is filmconversations.org. So, again, thank you, everybody. And um, good night. Well, good night for me. <laughs>